tomorrow. Um, we're going to do the Epic of Gilgamesh tomorrow, which I know that some of you, if you've been in my classes before, you might may have we may have been through the Epic of Gilgamesh before. So, you know, you're more than welcome to join in again, though. It's a good story. But today will give us the background on uh, who Gilgamesh was, if he was real at all, and how that goes. Oh, that's good to know, Armani. Brilliant. Um, yeah. Ah, very good, Josh. Yeah, Gilgamesh and Enkidu. Enkidu. Everyone loves Enkidu. You'll love Enkidu tomorrow once you once you get deep into the story of Gilgamesh and, of course, Utnapishtim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> some of the best names in history. Okay, so let's kick off then with our Sumerians. Now, what we're, what I've done is also in the same folder where um, I'm putting the videos, the recordings every day. I've put up a few little sheets like this. They're only simple little sheets, but the idea is that if you, um, that there's one for modern history, there's one for ancient history, and there's one for geography. Um, there won't be one for Fridays because I don't think we need one. We'll, we'll be doing our, 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 some different things with that. But the idea is on Mondays, we're going to go through the kings and queens, the monarchs of the UK uh, or England before. And there'll be a sheet there which will help you capture each monarch with a, you know, a picture and information about them and a five star rating. Uh, for geography, we're going to go through uh, an alphabet of countries. So we're going to, we started at A yesterday, we're going to go through B, C and etc. Um, and so there's a sheet there that will, which will help you capture information about each of those countries, the, the, the most important information. And for this, we're going to go through each lesson we do on a Wednesday will be a snapshot of a different civilization. So I'm not going to be able to go really deep into each civilization. We're going to look at all kinds of groups from uh, the Sumerians today. Uh, we'll look at uh, the ancient Greek cities in, in separate sessions. So we'll look at Athens and Sparta. We'll look at different periods of Roman history. We'll look at the Persians. Um, we'll look at people like the Hittites and the Indus Valley civilization. We'll look at uh, some Chinese uh, early ancient civilization as well um, and some South American. So um, for each of these different civilizations, I've got this sheet here, which you can print off if you like. And it's just somewhere for you to keep some bits of key information, so things that you find interesting. Um, give me some idea of some of the rulers um, of, the, of those civilizations. <laughs> Brilliant, yeah, that's good. So there's some uh, shout out for the Chinese, that's good. Um, and then we're going to have a look at, um, for each one, I'd like you to either write about or draw, draw a picture of an artifact or some architecture from that civilization. And most of these civilizations, they have something or other that you can look at that we have from the period, old stone carvings. Um, as you see today, we will have a standard. Um, or we might even go to Babylonia and look at Hammurabi as well, yes. <laughs> Ah, you would like to be an architect. That's good. We're going to look at a lot of architecture in this because one of the things when we're studying such ancient history is that all of the soft stuff has gone. There's no wood left. There's no clothing left. There's certainly no food left. Um, uh, we've got evidence of these things though, and it's usually the stone, the stone and the metal objects that are left. Um, having said that, there are, you know, there have been some other bits and bobs preserved. It's just very rare. So, most of the stuff we have for, for really ancient history is stone and metalwork, things like bones. Um, so um, what, what we'll be looking at is artifacts like that. And of course, buildings as well, because they tend to be built, built out of stone, or at least the ones that we still have. Okay. So yeah, like Stonehenge. Yeah, that's it, Joshua. Mm. Um, okay, so today we're going for Sumer. Um, if you don't have that sheet, that's fine. You can go and do it afterwards, or you can just ignore the sheet altogether. It's just something that might help you to keep these things together. Each week you can fill in another one, and by the end you should end up with a big stack of paper, I guess. Um, so let's zoom in first on where Sumer is. Now, the dates given here are a bit rough. To be honest, we don't know exactly when Sumeria uh, rose to power as a civilization. We've got a good idea, though. Uh, the little C here in front of our dates, if you can see that there, is stands for circa. And in history, we use the the little uh, little C circa to basically mean uh, roughly about sort of yeah, in that ballpark. That's what circa means. So we don't know the exact date, but we're going to say circa just about um, the year two thousand six hundred BC um, before Christ in the old old language. Um, in more modern times, we call that BCE, before common era. 
Either way, it's a really long time ago. We're looking at 4,600 plus years ago. So these guys were around um, before even my gran was around, to be honest. Um, it's a long time ago. And this is the area of the world where they were hanging out. It's called the Fertile Crescent. Um, if we were going, if, if we're going to have a look at where this is, here we can see the Mediterranean Sea. Just here we can see Greece coming down. This is Turkey, modern day Turkey. It wasn't called that back then as far as we know. Here's Egypt with the River Nile flowing uh, north into the Mediterranean. And the area called the Fertile Crescent is so called because it is a crescent, this shape, and it is fertile. Hmm, interesting. Um, fertile basically means lots of things can grow there. And the key to fertility in the ancient world, the key to making your lands wonderful and lush and good for agriculture, farming, growing things, is the rivers. These are the things that are important. So in Egypt, we'll, we'll look at Egypt in a future lesson, I'm sure, but in Egypt, you've got the River Nile flooding twice a year, bringing all those lovely nutrients from way down deep in Africa. Um, in Mesopotamia, this area here, also the Fertile Crescent, um, we've got two great big rivers that start off in the mountains here of northeastern Turkey, and they flow down all the way through this area, making this wonderful uh, river basin, which is super fertile for crops, and before draining out into the Persian Gulf. Um, the two rivers are the Euphrates and the Tigris, two mighty watercourses. Uh, when we're thinking rivers here, we're not thinking just, you know, the piddly old rivers that we might be used to in this country. We're going for, um, <laughs> we're going for um, good, wide, long rivers, especially by the time they get down to here. Rivers, they tend to start narrow and fast, and they end up like a human being towards the end of their life, much wider and plumper and slower but that means that that fertility is greatly increased because the rivers they bring with them all the wonderful nutrients all the lovely animal dung and dead bits of creature all those bugs all that silt all those nutrients all the way down the river and at first it's going so fast that those nutrients get dragged along bumped around until they come to the wide slow areas and then the rivers might flood and all those beautiful nutrients will end up in the soil ready for plants to, plants to grow. Hmm. Now, the first people that figured out that instead of running around um, attacking mammoths and, well, not mammoths at this period, but you know, wild animals, uh, and to stop bashing rocks together and stuff, uh, were people in this part of the world. Um, maybe not the Sumerians themselves, maybe people related to the Sumerians, um, but the first people to really start to settle down and figure out that we don't have to move around. We don't have to keep following herds of animals or going out into the, you know, the forests and looking for berries and mushrooms. Instead, what we can do is we can plant crops, we can get seeds and we can make them grow where we want. And they grow really well next to these rivers. So let's do that. And then because we're not moving around anymore, we can start building things. We can make homes out of stone because we don't need to pick them up anymore and move them with us. So once you start making homes out of stone, we then start end up with massive, great, big cities. And the Sumerians, they were the people to give us the first great cities on the planet. Uh -huh. Now, uh, ladies and gents, in the chat, I can see the chat's going really, really fast, so I cannot keep up with it. So, um, guys, uh, I know that some people are putting in lots of nonsense. So if you could cut that out, that'd be amazing. Um, but even more so, if you could stop telling people to stop putting nonsense into the chat, that would be really good too. because. Um, asking people not to spam is actually spam itself. So, um, yeah, cool. So if we can just save it for any direct questions you have, remember if you haven't been here before, what you can do is you can talk each other to privately, privately if you like, if you go down to the chat box and it says two, instead of clicking everyone, you can put it on a particular person, including myself um, or someone else that you might know in the chat and you can talk to them privately. So if you do want to just talk gobbledygook, you can do that to um, someone else. But if we keep the chat line open, then I can see what's going on um, and I can take the questions. Um, what, what I can do, if it helps, is I can, uh, change the chat settings so that people can only talk to me, which is fine, but I, I do know that people want to use this as a bit of a social event as well. So we'll see how it goes, but if it keeps going really fast, I'll just have to uh, have to bring it down. Oh, sorry, is my mic breaking up? Let me see if I can 
fix that. Uh, da -da. Uh, that might be better. Sometimes if I mute and unmute, that goes a bit better. Uh, that's a good question, Jasper. So uh, a question here, what is the difference between uh, AD and BC? So BC in the old terms means before Christ. So before the year zero, which is when Jesus was supposedly born, um, if you're going with that. AD is Latin, it's Anno Domini, which basically stands for the year of our Lord. So the year of our Lord, Jesus Christ, 2020 would be right now. 2020 Anno Domini. Sounds very, uh, so very highfalutin, that one does, yeah. So yeah, BC, before Christ, AD, Anno Domini. Um, there we go. Okay. So, um, the Fertile Crescent then, super, super fertile which is excellent. Um, it means that the people can settle down, they can build cities, they don't need to, um, they, they don't need to spend their time roaming and wandering, they can just start to build and settle down. And that brings with it all kinds of new ways of living that we kind of take for granted today. But in a hunter-gathering society, which would have come before the Sumerians, you know, you've got warriors, who fight things. You've got hunters. Um, you might have people to, who tell stories or pass on information. In a city, you can have all kinds of interesting and wonderful things like lawyers and judges. You can have uh, people start to really develop doctoring. Uh, we found from ancient Sumeria um, old scalpels. So we know people were doing surgery back then of some kind or another. I don't think I'd have liked to have been there back then though. Um, now, the first city, as far as we're called, Laura, uh, as, as far as we know, Laura, that's a good question, um, is probably Uruk, this city down here, if I zoom in a bit. Um, Uruk is going to be the setting for our story tomorrow, the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is the oldest story on Earth, which is why I'm starting with that one. Um, but really, the, the, these big cities all sort of grew up together, Uruk, Ur and Lagash, as far as we know. There are other big famous cities that, for those of you who know your Bible studies, if you do, or, or your Quran, I guess, I don't know if the names are exactly the same as the cities in Quran, but you might notice that we've got places like Nineveh, Babylon, of course, big uh, byword for evil in the Bible. And we've got Jerusalem over here, which may or may not have you know, been started. Um, it seems, you know, again, we've got to kind of use... Uh, archaeological history and mix that with things like biblical history but if you do know your bible stories abraham he lived in ur and he left ur traveled all the way uh, basically around the curve of the fertile crescent up the euphrates and over down into the lands of canaan where he created uh, you know the proto jerusalem i guess uh, so yeah, these are very, very old cities. By this point, probably there were cities rising up in Egypt at the same time, like Thebes. We know that there were cities growing in uh, Korea at a similar time too. China a little bit further behind, uh, but Korea, what is now today North Korea, seems to have been really going for it. And even, even some rumblings of civilization over in South America down in uh, Chile. But um, South America is a little bit different because they didn't discover bronze. Uh, they, they stuck with the Stone Age for a very, very long time down in South America, even though they were building big civilizations based on fertile river systems. Um, yeah, yeah, mythology is on Friday. Yeah, so I was uh, sorry, I said tomorrow, didn't I? To on Friday, we're going to be doing the story of the Epic of Gilgamesh. Yeah. So this is our setting for the Sumerians. They come out from hunter-gatherer societies and they start to build cities. And the key to that is the rivers. The rivers bring the lovely nutrients. They let people farm, which lets people sit, calm down and sit down. So here we've got another map of Sumer. Uh, we've got the main city here, Uruk. They've got other cities too, though. And there are other groups around them. So we have on this particular one, we have the city of Akkad. Now the Akkadians will become a great civilization after the Sumerians, or I suppose during the Sumerians, depending on how, you, how we look at it. Some people say that the Akkadians become the Sumerians because they take them over. Um, on Thursday, I have other commitments, so I cannot do a lesson on Thursday mornings, I'm afraid. Um, so it's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday is the idea. Yeah. Um, so the Akkadians will become big and they will eventually conquer Sumeria and take it over. Um, but Sumer and Akkad have two different languages, ways of speaking. Um, we've got the city of Larak here and Akshuk here. And then we've got the great civilization of Elam and the Elamites. Um, now over time, 
these cities grow bigger and smaller, um, Babylon will rise and take over the entire area for a short period of time. The Assyrians will come later and take the lot. Um, but you know, we're talking over hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, it's a long, long time period. So let's have a look in a bit more detail of what it might have looked like in Sumer. Um, here we have an artist represent representation, and behind me there's another one, of uh, a Sumerian city. Um, the one behind me is Uruk. I believe this one is supposed to be Uruk too, but of course we can only really guess at what these places look like. Um, our artist here has... Um, were there Incas? No, the Incas are not around yet. The Incas are much, much later civilization. Uh, the Incas are, I'm trying to remember my Incan dates. The, the, I think they're AD, the Incas, uh, the Aztecs, the Mayas, that they, they will come up a lot later than this. We're talking four plus, four plus thousand years ago um, for the Sumerians. That there, is, there, there are people in America, but yeah, we're, we're talking up to 2,000 years before the Incas are even starting to scratch their heads and you know get going. So yeah, we're old, old civilizations. Um, but yeah, this is what, this is a, a modern representation of what a Sumerian city would have looked like. Um, big high walls. The walls in the ancient world were always not just tall, but very, very thick. Um, we have uh, buildings that with very squared roofs. Um, it seems to make sense and it seems to fit with our archaeological evidence, which I'll show you in a minute, that the cities were very square, blocky affairs. Yeah. Um, now, if we look at this temple here, this, this is called a ziggurat, uh, which is very simple. Those of you asking about South America, Oh, the worksheet, if you want to grab the worksheet, it's in, I, I shared it on my Facebook page. Um, it's in the folder with the recordings from the other lessons. So, you know, don't, don't worry about printing out right now, maybe, unless you've got a printer right there. Um, but it's something maybe you can use going forward and you know, use it how, how you see fit. Um, but yeah, these ziggurats, they look very similar to the temples in South America. So I get why some of you are asking about Incas and Aztecs, you know, you, looking at the archaeology, uh, the, the architecture, um, we can see some definite similarities between uh, this part of the world, uh, Mesopotamia, between two rivers. Um, we can see this looking very much South American in, in some ways. Um, other than that, though, it's not such not so lush as South America. We're not seeing rainforests here. We're seeing grasslands, fertile lands for growing. But uh, if we go back to our map. Um, Really, the, the, the options are pretty limited for the people in this part of the world. If we go north, we hit mountains. If we go uh, east to Iran, we hit mountains. If we go south, we hit the Arabian Desert, and no one's growing anything there right now or back in this time. So, um, yeah, it's... Uh, oh, oh, did my mic die again? Sorry, guys. I'm sorry if my mic is breaking up. Um, usually it's okay, but I'll, I'll see if I can adjust it. Uh, um, ooh, how long did it take to make the walls? That's a good question. Um, the answer is, we don't know. Uh, we can imagine by looking at modern times that it would have taken quite a while. Um, the real mystery is, is not so much how they built the walls um, or how long it took, it's how did they cut the stone in the first place? Um, we're talking about civilizations here who have stone tools and bronze tools, which, you know, today we make, we, we can carve stone with diamond headed uh, machinery. The ancients didn't have that. They've got stone and bronze. They're, they're doing, we, we think, clever things with ropes and pulleys, maybe, but it's not, it's certainly not for sure. Um, so we can, we can assume that these walls took years to build, but uh, no, not concrete rock. Um, concrete is a very modern invention. That's 20th century stuff, concrete. So no, these are going to be sandstone, I guess. Uh, I'm not much of a stone expert, um, but I assume from this part of the world, we're looking at some kind of sandstone or something. Um, if we look at this picture here, though, this kind of tells us where this artist is getting their idea from. This is part of the city of Uruk as it is, is today. People of archaeologists have dug down under the sand and the dust and they found these squared off walls. So this is what they're, this is what they're building. It looks like brickwork. Um, so maybe they're making bricks out of uh, earth and things like that. Um, but it is, you know, as I say, I'm not much of an expert on building things. Um, <laughs> sandstone is, is basically a c compacted uh, um, 
I don't think the Romans ever got cement, not as far as I know. I mean, maybe something like uh, cement, but I know modern cement is certainly a 20th century invention. That's when we started to industrial production of cement. Um, so may maybe the Romans had something very similar. Um, I don't know if this is the bathroom. Um, I don't know. It could be any, any part, really, I guess. Um, it, it's really hard to tell because all we have left is the stones and all we have really is the foundation stones. We, we kind of have to guess how high these walls are from pictures, um, from descriptions that are written. Because luckily for us, and the reason that we can do the Epic of Gilgamesh on Friday, the Sumerians were one of the first groups of people on the planet to start writing things down. So we can come up with some ideas, but not much. Um, I'm assuming it's sandstone, but again, I don't know, I'm afraid. Um, my knowledge of rocks and stones is not great, um, especially not from pictures. It looks like sand, so we'll go for that. <laughs> okay, so here we've got um, a list of some of the kings of uh, Sumer. Now, you'll notice that the dates here are a little bit strange, okay? Now, we know if we go back um, far enough, we can go to, uh, we, we can start looking at archaeological evidence of kings. We have found a face mask of Sargon of Akkad from when the Akkadians conquered the area. Um, we have stories about King Gilgamesh, um, but no real evidence that he existed. Um, what we do have from ancient Sumer is something called the king list or the king's list. Um, this is a list of kings. It's kind of a catchy, uh, catchy name there. Uh, yes, I know a lot of you will, of course, know the epic of Gilgamesh, the Gilgamesh already, but a lot of people don't. So, you know, got to start somewhere. Um, yeah, yeah, you'll see there, Jasper, that somebody is ruling for thirty-six thousand years. Now, the king's list is a list that was created by later generations of Sumerians um, to explain their history. Now, if we go to the fringes of um, historical I don't know, research, there are plenty of people out there who believe that these king lists are correct, that people did used to live and rule for 28,800 years at a time. Uh, there's this sort of fringe belief that people in history used to be both bigger, we're talking 12, 14 feet tall, and that they used to live for a very, very long time. Partly that's encouraged by these ancient kings list. I am more of the opinion that these lists are probably just, you know, trying to explain something rather than, um, you know, uh, literal truth. Um, although the king's list, they do show, as I've only got the first uh, set of rulers up here. Uh, you can go on Wikipedia and find the full king's list uh, set out for you like this. Um, but the uh, they start off ruling for thousands of years. So the very first king, um, after he descended from heaven, so the kings are gods, um, uh, our first king as Alulim, and he rules for 28,800 years over the people of Sumeria. Then we have his son, assumedly, Alalgar. Mm, that's exactly how you say it. Uh, 36,000 years for him. And it keeps on going like that. Now, it ends rather ominously down here. And this is the reason I, I've included this bit today. It will tie in nicely with Friday's story. But then it says, then the flood swept over. Very ominous. The flood sweeps over. Everything is destroyed. Very, very similar to our Bible story about Noah and the flood and other flood stories from around the world, of course. Um, but some calamity befell uh, uh, Sumer and the flood swept over. And after that, the kings didn't rule for so long. The second um, list of kings, their kings, they die quite young. They die at around a thousand years old, something like that. No longer will they rule for 36,000 years. You know, uh, What kind of calendar do they use? That's a good question. Now, they understood. I don't know if they used a calendar that was linked, uh, a solar calendar or a lunar calendar. Um, I, I suppose I could look that up. What we do know about Sumerians is that they were highly advanced in terms of astronomy. They understood the pattern of the stars. And the reason that these numbers are as they are is to go with... Um, 
celestial cycles of the years. So they're, they're cycling through the zodiac, which takes what, uh, 24,000 years, something like that, if, if my memory is correct. So we're talking about people who are, who, are, who are working in zodiacal time. They're looking at the movement of the celestial houses through the sky and they're attaching different rulers to that. Um, but they're just saying that there is one particular ruler that rules through these thousands of year periods, uh, what we would call epochs today, I guess. Um, so the first king, what was the first king? That's a good question. Uh, we'll come to their gods in a minute, John. I've got some of those to show you in a second. Um, but what was their first king? Um, depends who you ask. Either their first king was a proper human. Um, the earliest one we have reference to is Gilgamesh, but we have no proof that he was real. Um, we do know later kings definitely existed. Um, uh, what was the first king? He could have been a half god. He could have been some kind of alien ruler. Some people say, wah, wah. Um, I'm not going with that though. Um, he was probably, I, I assume that Alulim is probably purely fictional, but you know, yeah, if you're the kind of person that likes the, likes the exciting stories, then maybe not. All right, let's come to some real evidence. Okay, so the king's list tells us the kings, but might not be so reliable. Um, what we have here is something from Ur itself. This is called the Standard of Ur. Um, it's basically a great big wooden box. And yes, I know some of you will have seen these before for sure. Um, this is a great big wooden box that we think not sure, but we think would have been put on a pole, a bit like a great big wooden solid flag. So a standard is something that you will uh, maybe carry in front of you to battle to try and uh, get the troops, you know, um, in good marching order and you know keep their morale high. It may be not a military standard, it might be a standard that was just put a, a box that was put on a pole in the palace to kind of tell a story. Um, it might not have been a standard at all. We don't really know. And um, the man who found it, um, C. Leonard Woolley, he dug it up in the 1920s, I believe. Um, and he called it the standard of Ur, but we, we don't necessarily know. Now, yes, both of these pictures, Rock, are from the same box. This is the two sides of the same box. So we'll just uh, have a look at these. And they do tell us a lot about the Sumerians. So let's start with our top line up here. If I, squeak, ooh, I can move myself out of the way a bit. There we go. So here we have a king. This is a king of Sumer, a king of Uruk or Ur or some, um, well probably Ur because this was dug up in Ur I guess. Um, but the king we can tell is the king. Firstly because he's sat down on what might be a throne. Um, also they've, the artist has made him a lot bigger than the other people. Again the ancients they either represented their leaders as bigger or the fringe people in in historical societies will say people were big back then we were led by giants um it's more likely that we weren't <laughs> so our king here is shown to be super big and super important so big that his head actually goes up through the border so we know that he's important um i don't know if that's his wife that's a good interpretation though i mean what i'm going to tell you about this really is down to interpretation because we have no instruction manual to go with it no written description from the time we just have these pictures and we've got to unpiece them and figure them out for ourselves i guess um but maybe it's his wife i, I kind of assume that he's a servant just because he has no hair um, I think the women might have have hair instead, but you know, I don't know. That could just be a modern assumption that I'm putting on it. Mm. So up here we have other rich noble people. They're all sat down with the king. They are drinking what we can assume is wine or some other alcoholic liquid, probably. And then we have servants who seem to be going around handing those drinks out. So these guys here walking about, they might be giving food and drink to the king and his nobles. We've got another servant or slave at the back here playing some kind of harp-like instrument. So, you know, these guys are basically having a nice time. Um, um, uh, there were no women back then. There were definitely women back then. Um, so these are, these are the rich guys hobnobbing in the palace, maybe drinking wine, having a nice party, listening to music. Um, underneath them, we get a different story we get maybe the merchant classes, the middle classes. Um, um, is, it, is that a fire on the top? Oh, it might be a fire. Yes. I'm not sure if this is an, an area here that's, you know, just 
it could be a fire. It looks like almost like he's warming his hands on it, or it could just be part that's scratched away and we've lost the detail. Uh, that's a good, good interpretation. Uh, yes, this class is meant for key stage two, so uh, ages what uh, seven to eleven is the idea. Yeah. <coughs> Um, the box is called the standard of Ur. Um, I can write that on here. Here we go. So if you do want to look that up further, you can go and find it. Hang on. Standard of Ur. There we go. So, um, <laughs> brilliant. Oh, happy birthday. <laughs> Um, so we've got our middle classes here. These seem to be trading people, maybe people who maybe farmers, workers like that. We've got people with their animals. We have goats, some very hairy goats over here, some less hairy goats. We have cows and we have people sort of bringing them along, maybe to market or something. And then at the bottom, we seem to have the poorest people. Yeah, we can tell they're a bit poorer because these guys are carrying lots of heavy stuff. Instead of nice, uh, valuable animals like cows and goats, they've got donkeys. Um, so maybe these donkeys, or they could represent horses, I guess, but they're quite small, so maybe donkeys. Um, it looks like these people have got sacks on their backs or big heavy loads. So they could be the, pe the peasants or the, the, oh, uh, the equivalent of peasants back then. They could be slaves uh, marching off, you know, carrying stuff for the richer people who are above them. So this definitely tells us that the society in these Sumerian cities was very much uh, divided. You know, we have very poor people, we have very rich people, and we have the people in the middle, which you know, we'd understand from today's society, I guess. Now, they probably are slaves, but it's hard to tell just from this picture. Um, the thing that makes me think they are slaves is if we take a look at the other side. Now, this side of the standard is called the peace side. The other side is called the war side. Now, unfortunately, I haven't got quite such a good um, uh, quality of picture here, but we can, we can see what's going on. So at the top here, we have what looks like uh, a battle in progress. We have soldiers marching along, we have people attacking other people, we have people falling to the ground, um, and w if, we, uh, if we look at these people here, uh, it's been assumed that these are people who have been captured and turned into slaves, maybe. Um, let's see if I can find a better quality picture, because it's not, it's not surviving very uh, well, is it, uh, in this layer, let's see. Uh, here we go. Let's see if I can find a better quality one. Ah, this one looks better. Let's get rid of you. Let's hope that this one holds its quality a bit better. Here we go. That's better already. Ah, uh, this is yeah. There we are. We can see the other side. Right. So up here, here we go. This is the proper one. We've got the horses coming along. Uh, we're pulling a chariot, probably the king's chariot. We know that this guy, or we can assume that this guy is the king because he's so tall that he pokes up through the top of the, of the picture. Yeah. Um, yeah, so these are two sides of the same box. Okay, that's the idea. Um, so our, our leader here, here they're capturing slaves and they're dragging them around. Here we can see the soldiers, uh, probably the elite soldiers. They've got what looks like helmets cloaks with spots which could tell us maybe they're leopard print or something like that or just decorated cloaks here it gets a bit savage we can see people stabbing other people people on the ground um, and here it looks like they're taking slaves maybe uh, or this could just be the enemy running away it's really hard to tell um, <laughs> uh, the box is called the standard of Ur, so it's written down here they are the standard of Ur. Is the box. Uh, we think it might have been put on a pole and, and sort of used as a big wooden flag, but we're, we're not sure. Um, well, Laura, we don't know exactly what they used to wear in battle. The only evidence we have is from things like this. So going by just this one piece of evidence, they used to wear spotty cloaks, um, hoods that look like those swimming uh, caps, and they would hold spears, although we can't see the points of the spears because they're behind each of these other guys. Um, so that's maybe what the soldiers were wearing. We can also see here that um, usually, uh, Lucy, they're referred to as the peace side and the war side. So this shows uh, the city of Ur at war. This one shows the city of Ur at peace. That's usually the interpretation anyway. Um, 
Now down here, this can be interpreted in different ways as well. Whoa, my chat box has just become huge. Oh no, go away. Um, this can be interpreted in different ways. This could be a line of chariots running along um, in a battle, and you can see these poor unfortunates who are being struck down by the horses. This, this guy here has been trampled completely and is just a blob now, pretty grim. Um, so it could be a line of chariots going by. Some people, though, think that this, in fact, could be a kind of ancient version of trying to show action. So because of the way the horse's legs move, this could be the same chariot shown four times. So it starts off walking, then it leads into a, a bit of a faster canter, maybe knocks over this guy, then it's fully galloping over this guy and knocking over a second, and then it's sort of rearing up at the end. So it could be the same chariot that's moving through. Yeah, it, it's unclear though, it could be four different chariots. Um, that's one interpretation. And when it comes to ancient history, it all comes down to interpretation. What do we think these things mean? You know, we think that this must have been an important piece of an, a, a, an important artifact, something kept in a throne room or carried to battle. But for all we know, it was just some guy, you know, made a box, put some random pictures on it that made very little sense. You know, maybe this is his version of Lord of the Rings. You know, he's just making up a cool story. Um, and that's that. We don't know. You know, it comes down to what's more probable. And it's more likely that this was important, but we're never going to know for sure. Uh, what's that thing on top of the horse? Uh, let me see. Oh, well, like these things that look like wind-up horses. Yes, I think these are the, what would you call it, the bit that attaches the chariot to the horse. So we can see that the, the oh, I don't know if you'd call it a yoke or something like that, but we've got some kind of saddle here, which is connecting to a strip, which is pulling the chariot along. Um, who did they fight against? That's a good question. Um, other cities, basically, at different times, Sumer grows and contracts, um, uh, depending on who takes over what. So the different Sumerian cities would have fought against each other, uh, would have fought against Uruk. Then you've got people like the Elamites to the east, who are a completely different group of people, so they would have fought those. There would have been constant raids, we can imagine, from the southern deserts, um, you know, people who would later become Arab peoples, maybe from Arabia, coming up from the south and raiding. Um, likewise, from the east, from Iran, uh, over the Zagros Mountains, there would have been raiders, we can assume. Uh, north from Turkey, maybe. Uh, plus, you know, you've got, uh, I, I don't know of any direct warfare between the Sumerians and the Egyptians, but there could well have been clashes there. There's certainly enough civilizations going along at the same time to lead to a ruckus when they wanted one, that's for sure. Yeah. So let's see over here. Now we do know a bit more than just uh, from what we can see in our standard of Ur. Um, this again, it's, it's not brilliant quality, I'm sorry, but this is Sumerian writing. Ah, there you are, Laura. Yeah. So this is their writing. It's called cuneiform, uh, the general style of writing, which is basically you get clay and you put dots, dashes, squiggles in it, you know, to make your words. Um, the Sumerian alphabet has been translated, so this can be read, not by me, I hasten to add, but people can read this. Um, scholars and the like, people with great big long beards and wonderful huge brains. Um, and the story that we're going to have on Friday, the myth from Friday, that comes from you know, a direct set of stone tablets with cuneiform writing on them. Now, the Sumerians, they spoke what we call Sumerian. Yeah, makes sense. Um, uh, but in later history, they would have also spoken Akkadian. Uh, there seems to be two languages that are similar but different. Um, maybe a good comparison would be Portuguese and Spanish. You know, they're very similar in some ways, but also very different. Uh, yes, I suppose, yeah, yeah, I hadn't thought of that, but I imagine ancient cuneiform would have worked quite well as Braille because you're not writing it on paper with ink. Instead, you're inscribing it in tablets. So I suppose if you learn to read with your fingers, um, ancient uh, sources wouldn't be too bad for people with uh, uh, limited visibility. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting idea there. Yes, it would work. Um, now, Rock, I don't know how people worked out Sumerian um, in the first place. Um, I mean, different languages have been, different codes, languages have been cracked in different ways. Um, uh, I know how Egyptian hieroglyphs were. Uh, cracked, so we'll talk about that at some point. But I'm not sure how, who first broke the Sumerian, the cuneiform code, but 
you know we, we've known it for a while it's one of the older ones that you know one of the longest ones that we've had in our arsenal of languages um are they famous for something well um are they famous for something? I suppose the claim to fame of the Sumerians of being the first city builders on the planet. I think that's a pretty big one. Um, yeah, the Rosetta Stone was for the Egyptians. I'm not sure if there was a, a Rosetta Stone equivalent for the Sumerians. Yeah. I don't know exactly what this bit says. This is some kind of receipt. It's quite boring. Um, uh, it's like, you know, some kind of receipt for sacks of grain or something. Um, a lot of the writings we have from ancient history are not that exciting yeah it's kind of like well people had to write stuff down and we're kind of left with what we're left with we don't get to choose which bits of writing we keep so i imagine we've lost loads of really cool poems and stories and we're left with you know receipts and you know messages from bob to jim about how nice the weather is today so you know some of it's not so good um the language is usually called their language is sumerian um the alphabet they're using is uh, cuneiform is the uh, is the is the oh hang on let me bring that back uh, cuneiform is what they're using for what 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 we call the stand the style of writing the alphabet kind of thing they're using uh, here we go Ooh, put myself back. all right so let's let's move on and have a look at some godly things because everyone likes a bit of the gods don't they. Um, <laughs> of course of course you can go and you can look at the the video later that's no problem at all um so the sumerians like lots of other civilizations that we'll look at in ancient history they were polytheistic which means they have multiple gods they have a lot of gods um they have big gods and small gods important gods and not so important gods so i've picked just a few of them here two gods and two goddesses for us to you know have a look at um it's a bizarre family tree um enkidu is not here i'm afraid enki is not enkidu although you can see that their names are very similar enkidu is related to enki in some way maybe <laughs> um uh, oh that is not a horse but we'll come to that um so one of the most important Sumerian gods is the god of the sky, Anu. Uh, and this is him here. Um, one thing that links together the people from Sumeria with uh, their gods is amazing facial hair. And Anu is not going to be left out. He's got these amazingly well braided, I guess, or I don't, I'm not sure what you would call that style there. Um, braided sideburns, a great big braided beard. Um, he's supposed to be kind of the father of the gods. He's a bit, you know, if we think later civilizations like Greece, he's a bit like a Zeus character or maybe an Odin character, that kind of father of the gods thing. Um, he's not the original. There are a layer of gods be above and beyond him who lived in more primordial, uh, primordial times. Um, but Anu is there as this kind of symbol of justice. He tells the other gods what to do. Um, he looks after the people to an extent, but also can you know, bring disaster down on people as punishment for things. Um, uh, Idris, there are lots of gods. If we're going to add up all the gods that have ever been, we're talking thousands and thousands. In fact, you know, go to India today and there will be over, well over a thousand Hindu gods being, being worshipped today in India alone. And that's now. So we go through history. There's a lot of gods, uh, you know, wherever they are there's a lot of space up there hopefully otherwise they're they're really squeezed in right now um people do generally have uh, yeah people did have a god for everything i'm not sure how small the, the sumerian gods got uh, you know we're left with evidence of the most important ones but there could well have been a lot of gods um so anu is you know he's there making sure that justice happens but it's difficult because not all of his other gods, his fellow gods, a lot of them who are his children, and not a lot of them do what he says. You know, there's always naughty gods who are messing about and you know, making problems. Um, they did have a god of hinges. Yeah, but I, I don't see why that's surprising. I mean, hinges are really important. Yeah. Um, oh, Rock, Enki is not a gnome. Um, Enki, I, I do see where you're getting that from, though. <laughs> He does look a bit like it. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Loki is a good example of a, of a mischievous god. And let's go to our next one. Let's go to Enki. Enki is the god of the waters and fertility. 
which means um, I did want to show you a family tree of the uh, the gods of Sumeria, but I, I decided not to because it just gets a bit too weird. Um, let's just put it this way, though. Enki um, has a lot of children and a lot of wives. Um, he makes a lot of babies. Most of the gods in some way are related to Enki. He's either their husband or their father, or in many cases, both. He's like this god who's just all over the place making new gods. Um, he's also a bit of a trickster god. He's never doing as he's told. He, you know, he sneaks up on people. He performs tricks on people. Um, he says one thing to Anu. He says, yes, Anu, I'll go and do this thing. And then he goes and does the opposite. So, yeah, he's, he's a bit like Loki in the later, later Viking myths. Or... Uh, Dionysus, I suppose, uh, in the Greek myths, we could we could call some links there, because um, Dionysus, of course, is 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 all about um, fertility and new life, just like Enki is. And Dionysus, of course, also the god of madness and partying. So, you know, problematic for sure. Not not the easiest god to control. Um, and that's right, Idris. Yeah, Dionysus is a great god. This is true. A god of wine. Um, do they have a god of eyebrows? Hmm. I don't know. Maybe, but I don't know. Hmm. Good question. Um, Inanna is not wearing anything. No, she's not. Uh, and there's a reason that we'll come to her in a minute. Um, so we've also got this rather scary goddess here. This is Tiamat. Now Tiamat is uh, one of the mother goddesses, but she's a really dangerous uh, character. Um, we're not going to do the full myth of, of Tiamat, but uh, her myth is cool. Um, in one of the creation myths of the Sumerians, Tiamat, she, she creates the earth, um, but she goes to war. She goes to war with her own children and she is defeated. Uh, she sends forth terrible monsters. Um, she gets these... Uh, oh, hello. Uh, she brings forth a whole load of really scary monsters. The way the Sumerians describe these monsters, some of them include uh, the Lion Man, um, the, uh, what's the other one? The Dragonfly, which in their words is, is a monster. I'm not sure if a dragonfly sounds massively scary. I imagine when they say it, they mean like a dragon-sized fly or maybe a fire-breathing fly? I don't know. Um, I don't think they mean the dragonfly that we're familiar with, but she sends forwards, you know, dragons and lion men and, uh, and uh, half man, half scorpion creatures, and she tries to destroy the world, basically, before her son Marduk kills her and makes, you know, the fertile lands of Sumeria out of her body and her blood, which is a bit of a grim one. I prefer to just go with the, it was the rivers that was important. But she was an important go goddess here, Matt, even if she was, uh, you know, a scary goddess. And she doesn't look human like the rest. She looks like a great big beastie. Yeah, so there you go. Oh, what's this we've got here? <laughs> ah, thanks, John. There you go. That's uh, some good, uh, good points about uh, the gods there. Thank you. Hmm. Um, now we can come down here as well to uh, another goddess uh, she's one of my favorite her name is also Ishtar later because the uh, Assyrians they also believed in all these gods but they gave them different names much like the Romans gave the Greek gods different names so Zeus became Jupiter um, Aphrodite became Venus um, this is the Sumerian version of Venus or Aphrodite if such a thing exists um, there are definitely links so Inanna is the goddess of new life, love, beauty, but also war. Yeah, so she's a very, very dangerous goddess. She is a bit like Enki. She's one of the goddesses that Anu cannot trust. She's always going around, getting into scrapes. You know, she'll, everything will seem to be going fine and Anu will give her a simple instruction and she'll go and mess it up on purpose. Um, she'll start wars. She'll make people fall in love with the wrong people and, you know, drive people mad out of desire and then, you know, end up with them in trouble and all this kind of stuff. So um, people say that probably um, when the Greeks were just, you know, creating their religious pantheon, their polytheistic group of gods, they, they were probably drawing from earlier gods because these gods were are, are older than the Greek ones. So Inanna probably became uh, Aphrodite, which makes sense because each of these gods were representing different uh, planets in the sky. And can anyone guess which planet Inanna was uh, representing if she's linked to Aphrodite? 
Uh, Tiamat was like the mother of the gods, I think. Venus, very good, Chris. Yeah, well done. Oh, and Tabby. No, well, well done, Venus. Yeah, so we know that Inanna was linked to Venus and she was the goddess of love and she was the goddess of fertility. And the Greeks then, they have their goddess Aphrodite who is linked to Venus and is all about love and fertility, but also troublesome. And then the Romans come along and they just name her Venus. And that's where we get the name from the planet from in the first place. So maybe when we look up at the sky, instead of saying, there's Venus, we should say, there's Inanna dancing around with no clothes on, uh, making mischief again, because you know, that's what she does. So what we don't know necessarily, definitely girl power. Oh yes, the goddesses in uh, Sumeria were just as powerful, if not more powerful than the gods. Even though Anu was in charge, he's the kind of guy who's in charge, but not really in charge. You know, He, he's, he, he tries to stomp his feet and, and make things happen. But his children, they just, they just mess around all the time and get things, get, get into scrapes and ruin all of Anu's carefully laid plans, usually. <laughs> uh, leads to good stories anyway. Um, so yeah, Anu would be linked to Zeus, I think. Yeah. Now it's it's not it's not that we can exactly link one to the other, but because Enki, of course, he's the god of mischief, so uh, and fertility, so that fits with Dionysus. But he's also a water god, so it also fits with Poseidon. So it's not an exactly one for one system we've got here. Uh, Tiamat, we could link to maybe Gaia in ancient Greece. You know, this idea of Mother Earth in some way, although the vicious, violent form of Mother Earth. In, yeah, or that's what she becomes. Um, yeah, the, no, there was a god of chaos. Yes, I don't know if, the, if there's a particular god of chaos as is in Sumeria. Um, there are other gods, lesser gods, like Nurgle, the god of disease. Um, he's quite cool. If you like disease, yeah, I don't. Maybe he's you know, running around Sumeria right now, you know, causing problems. Um, uh, there were other gods of love and there were there are other gods of s certain planets and the skies and things in different aspects and the gods would also change their forms at times as well Enki is particularly good at doing this sometimes he'll appear looking like this sometimes he'll appear looking like an animal you know they, they can cause all kinds of problems um, yes we do have enough disease for now on the planet so Nurgle go away <laughs> yeah that's it go back to Sumeria Go and hang out in Uruk and leave us alone for a bit. <laughs> um, oh, that's a good question. I don't know if the Sumerians had pigs. So I don't know if there would be a god of pigs. Um, I imagine there'd be wild pigs. But if we go back to things like the standard of Ur, it doesn't look like pigs were being domesticated. Or at least if they were, they were not... Um, they were not shown in, in importance here. We don't see any pigs here. Um, I, I haven't looked into pigs. Um, uh, not quite spelt like that, Nurgle, Alfred. Uh, spelt a little bit different. Um, <laughs> he is the god of disease in Warhammer 40,000. Yeah, very good, Jasper. Yeah. Um, of course, uh, those guys who made Warhammer 40,000, they might have they might have borrowed just a little bit here and there from uh, from uh, real life history. You know, you know. Might, they might not have come up with all their names on their own. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, was there a god of gods? I suppose that's a good question here. Um, I suppose if there's any god of the gods, it would be Anu. But I don't think there's any gods of the of the concept of godliness. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. I think. Um, uh, if you want to have a look for the family tree, uh, where was I looking? I did find a good a good copy of the family tree on Wikipedia. I think uh, under the, the the main Sumer article. I think. Um, I'm not sure. Often I find the pictures and I don't find out where they where they linked to. Sorry about that. Um, but yeah, there you go. So yeah, th there's a um, a lot of uh, a lot of gods to to go and study and you know, delve deeply into if you want to. Um, so we'll we'll wrap it up now. But Sumer Sumer then, you know. We can't really talk about, you know, this king did that and this king did the other thing. And, you know, this is when they went over there and fought the Elamites. We know that they did, but, you know, dating these things and working out the motivations behind their actions is hard. Um, it's hard to understand how they lived day to day, but we do have some evidence. We have, you know, we know they're trading. We know that they're farming. We have some images to help us try and understand. We've got parts of their cities left, but not much. So we kind of have to rely on our own modern interpretations of that. And we can definitely say that these people benefited from the geographical location that they were in. Oh, thank you, Laura. That's a useful link. Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, so 
Um, on Friday, we will have a, a look at the earliest story in the world. I mean, if there's one thing to take away from the Sumerians, it's that they were the first, yeah? They were the first to build great cities that housed thousands of people. Um, they were the first to start, you know, to leave us written poetry and written stories. Um, now, that doesn't mean they're the first to start creating stories, but, you know, it's the earliest copies that we have come from them. So they, they do hold an important part in history, for sure. Um, so um, if after this lesson you want to you know, write up any notes that you've got or draw some pictures in these boxes, that'd be great. You can find the sheet in the shared drive and the recording for this will be up in that shared drive soon too. Uh, so thank you very much, everyone. Um, if you do have any follow-up questions or whatever, that's great. Uh, you can always send me an email. If you want to share any of your work with me, you can do that too. That'd be amazing. So um, I will see, hopefully, a lot of you on Friday for a bit of story time where we'll go through the epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, thank you very much, guys.